Welcome to my backyard. Today I want to share with you the amazing story of Alima Lee McFarlane, the once overweight college student struggling to find her way to a few short years later world Bellator champion. How did that happen? It happened because she learned the lessons necessary to win. Join me now, Lessons in Winning with Alima McFarlane. I'm with Alina McFarlane. We've been together since the early days when our career first started. I'll never forget that first time we met. Since the beginning. Now here you are, mm -hmm. double time champion, right? Yes. You've been in it twice now, yeah? Yes. And we got some breaking news. We're gonna start breaking news. Here it comes. What's coming soon? So, you know, I, I most recently defended my title December 15th at Bellator Hawaii and I'm jumping right back in. I will be fighting again, defending my belt for a third time, April 27th in San Jose. April 27th, San Jose, can't wait. Alima, from world championships, selling out arenas, mm -hmm. to the first fight against the soccer mom. Yes. What was that like to <sighs> knock out the soccer mom and go from that to this? It's been quite the experience. I mean, honestly, when I was fighting against the soccer mom, um, I never thought that I would even go pro with a, a big organization such as Bellator, much less become the champion and one of the most recognizable fighters, I guess, in the organization yeah. and in the division. So, yeah, I mean, I never thought it would come this far, but here I am. You were waiting tables. <laughs> yeah. You were trying to find a place to train. You were even finishing up schooling. Mm -hmm. You've got a master's degree. I do, yeah. yes. So smarts, beauty, <laughs> athleticism, she's a catch, she's a catch. So yes. what's your master's in? So my master's is actually in liberal arts and sciences with a focus on indigenous issues. Mm -hmm. So I was initially going to school because I wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. I wanted to teach social studies or history and I was trying to get credentialed. I wanted to be a teacher and then my life kind of just took a little detour once I finished grad school was, was actually when the soccer mom fight happened. Mm -hmm. Give fighting a shot with the blessing of my parents. I, you know, they said, yeah, I might as well just do it for a little bit while you're young. And that was <laughs> like four years ago or something. That was in 2015. You're not waiting yeah. tables anymore. I'm not, and I'm not selling t-shirts out of the trunk of my car either. So <laughs> that's nice. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I have a car where my trunk actually works now and I'm not really, I'm not living that difficult fighter lifestyle that I I was uh, transitioning through for a bit there. Oh yeah, I remember. Remember the, mm -hmm. the apartment, I remember the struggles, I remember all those things. Mm -hmm. And But there's something about you that I found very interesting. The first time I talked with Alima, the first session we did, here's what sets her apart. She listens and she does. She's one of the most coachable athletes I've ever worked with. Where did you get that coachability from? That's actually is what sets me apart and, and was what brought me this far. Because I honestly don't consider myself very athletic and uh, physically athletic. You know, I'm not the strongest person. I'm not the most explosive. I can't run to save my life. I can't even, I can barely do like three pull-ups. And But I think what has uh, made me successful is I'm coachable. You know, I think that it also reflects uh, how I, I went to college. Like I do have a master's degree. I'm you always, follow through. Exactly. Like mm. I'm always a student. I'm always learning. My mind is, is a sponge. And so I think that again, that has, is what makes me a good athlete mm -hmm. is that ability to learn and to listen to my coaches and to use my mind, um, my mind over everything. Mm -hmm. Cause as we know, yeah. our mental game and our mind accounts for the majority Absolutely. of the sport. If the mind's not right, the body can't follow. It doesn't exactly. know what to follow. So you've had some excellent coaches and I know many of your coaches well. And what makes you think that, or what has caused you all to click the way you have? <clears throat> I think all of us, I, so I truly believe that fate was what led me through those doors. 
I mean, maybe it was a matter of convenience because I worked at the restaurant right down the road, but I think that everything, there was a plan for me. And part of that plan was to drive by that gym every day. And while I think that I may have, I might have found success in other gyms, like I, you know, I get along with people, I'm chill. Um, but again, like Manolo, Bill and I, we just click and we're so cohesive. We're, you know, they're my best friends. I call them my gym dads. We're all very loyal people too. They've been together since the beginning. Uh, and I really can't see myself going to another team or I, I I didn't realize how rare that was actually. Oh, it's very sport. rare. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of gym hopping, coach hopping for sure. Yeah, and I didn't realize that and um, that what this situation that I'm in is very, very special. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm not going to do anything that would ruin that. It's brought you this far. Exactly. Great guys. I always say Manolo is the most inappropriate, appropriate guy I've yeah. ever met in my life. <laughs> yeah. I love that guy. He's amazing. <laughs> now, with that in mind, <laughs> Your whole life has been a series of U-turns. You used to be a hula dancer, mm -hmm. a pretty good one at that. Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah, so hula was actually my first love, pretty much. Uh, I mean, I came from a family of athletes, and it was always kind of written for us that we were gonna we were gonna eventually go over to sports. But first, we were hula dancers, and so I had been dancing since I was a little baby. And then I, I started making the transition to sports. You know, my father was a Hall of Fame athlete at Punahou High School. And Punahou High School, by the way, amazing school, amazing faculty, amazing. I love that place. Yes, we actually, my senior year, I believe, we were voted uh, by Sports Illustrated as the top school in the nation for sports programs. Wow. So, yeah, it's a very prestigious school. And I started making the transition over to sports. I've been playing uh, soccer, basketball, volleyball, wrestling since I was a little kid. And, uh, but you know, hula, again, it's always something that I'll carry with me. That's always what I identify as. I was first a hula dancer. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love that I can get in the cage, throw down, um, you know, get into a fist fight with somebody, then take the gloves off and go dance a hula for you know, celebration. <laughs> so I, I kind of just love the- um, I've witnessed that first that, yes. after yeah. her bell for her last fight uh -huh. in Hawaii, yeah. We had a Lua at her house mm -hmm. and she did an amazing hula. It was so fun. And I think too that uh, just having that uh, movement uh, or that training in yeah. that movement was mm -hmm. what kind of um, set set the standards for. I, I'm just, I understand body movement mm -hmm. because of my dance training. Yeah. Now, your dance training led you to other sports you had the movement of the body you were you had good body awareness mm -hmm. you were a good wrestler in high school mm -hmm. tell me about that yeah it was the same thing i i mean i was very aware of of body movement and i could just i picked up wrestling like i i was a natural if you asked if you asked any of my wrestling coaches i was kind of just a natural i picked it right up and um you know i if a coach explain a move, I could picture myself doing it. I could already feel it in my body, even though I'm just sitting there watching. I could just, I could feel and imagine how it's supposed to feel. And so, um, yeah, I was a state champion my senior year of high school. I actually graduated 10 years ago, exactly, 2009. And so this year's our 10 year reunion. I'm really pumped for that. Um, so yeah, I, I actually suffered um, a knee injury my freshman year. It was actually at a, at a wrestling camp with the Olympic coach, Terry Steiner at that oh, time. Yeah. And Sarah McMahon was actually his assistant at that camp. And I suffered an ACL tear, had to get surgeries a few times throughout high school. I had two surgeries and tore um, both knees a few times. And so anyway, that um, I made it to finals my sophomore, I was out freshman year, made it to finals my sophomore and junior year, lost in the finals. Senior year, I finally won my state title and then stopped playing sports. After interesting. That. So you stopped after you were a champion. Now, this is mm -hmm. interesting. You have injuries, you have losses, but you don't quit. You fight to the finish. What were the, what's the main lesson you learned about winning through high school? I was actually one of those athletes where I was I was undefeated. Like I was the kind of a prodigy for for the wrestling team. Mm -hmm. And this was before the injury. Before, yep. And I was undefeated all throughout intermediate. I was even wrestling boys. I was training with the varsity team as a middle schooler. 
So when I finally suffered that first loss, I think it was it was coming back from the knee injury. Mm -hmm. I suffered that first loss. And it was after actually like I had a very good season. I was pretty much undefeated the whole season. And I think I lost in in like our um, ILH uh, finals or something mm -hmm. like that. Even though I secured a spot to the States, I, I had lost the the private school region um, and I was devastated. And I was crying mm -hmm. and I just, I didn't know what that feeling was like because I never lost before. And so after that, you know, I just learned that it's going to happen. Like losing is part of the game. And if you accept it, then everything comes easy and yeah. there's no more pressure on you. And yeah. it's fun. So that's kind of the mentality that I've kept throughout my fighting career mm -hmm. is that it's going to happen. So might as well just go out there and have fun. If you weren't going to be a fighter, what would you be doing right now? A, I would either be a teacher mm -hmm. or I would be an NFL housewife. Oh, that's... Because remember... Yeah, I remember that. When I first started, I w had the NFL boyfriend who yeah. we were together for six years. I thought... Everyone thought that we were going to get married and that this is the one. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to move out to Colorado and be a housewife and live the life. Um, but he <laughs> wasn't that supportive of me fighting. Uh, he and which is understandable because it kind of fighting kind of came out of the nowhere. Yeah. And I kind of just surprised him like, hey, by the way, I'm going to start fighting. So um, I understand, you know, he wanted a supportive girlfriend who would be there at home, you know, when he gets home from his games and, and move, he wanted me to move out there and mm -hmm. I didn't want to uproot my life in San Diego. So it's understandable. Long story short, didn't work out. And, um, yeah, I essentially chose, chose to pursue fighting rather than this relationship, um, which worked out. So worked I'm glad out I did. pretty well. <laughs> yeah, undefeated yeah. champion. Life's going good. So mm -hmm. now if, there was one song and only one song you can listen to for the rest of your life. What would it be? For the rest of my life. What song? What's my go-to song? You know, it'd probably be a Hawaiian song. Um, you know, Everything That Glitters <clears throat> Isn't Gold by Kolea. Ah. It, and it's a, so it's a remake by a Hawaiian artist. Yeah. But I mean... I think YouTube just automatically plays it for me and I can just listen to it all the time. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And and what's a hobby or something people aren't aware you do with your free time? Okay. I am the karaoke queen. <laughs> I love karaoke. Great. Yeah, I have three microphones at my house. Oh nice. Um yeah, I just that's that's my my thing. And what do you what do you attribute to your mom and dad in raising you to become the outstanding person you are today. I attribute everything to them. I mean, and, and you saw it in my luau, how yeah. emotional I got talking about them. And, and so I'll just say what I, I said at the luau, mm -hmm. um, that they are the best people I know. And that's how I want my legacy to be. Mm -hmm. I don't care about how much money I make or, or you know, the bell or how far I get in, in fighting or in my career, what I want people to remember me by is how I made them feel and if I was a good person or not. And that's what I learned from my parents is that um, everybody loves them and and they're, again, they're the best humans I know. I would testify to that. I met her a few <laughs> times, they're amazing family, amazing love uh, through all the family at the Lou. It was, it was an amazing thing to yeah. see. And so, when it's all said and done, lessons in winning, what are the main lessons in winning you'd like to share with the audience? To win graciously. And, you know, I actually learned that from my hula teacher when I was a little girl. She said she taught us to always be gracious no matter what. And I'm one of those athletes, I, I just can't stand seeing winners who excessive celebration, um, you know, trash talking to their opponent. I just, it, it like hurts me. And mm -hmm. I feel as if it hurts the sport. And, and the basis of mixed martial arts is respect. And so I, you know, I always say like, win graciously. Well, Lima, thanks again for being Thank here. You. You're amazing. We're gonna Thank share you. a little technique with the audience, Ooh, yeah, okay? Yeah. So let's do that right now. Okay.
So, Alima, remember that first time we got together, we did mental and physical. A lot of people know me as the mental edge guy, but I also have an extensive martial arts background. What's the first thing I taught you? My first fight four years ago um, to keep my hook level and to use my hips on it. Yeah, because what were you doing before that? It was coming down from here. It was being like a wet noodle, and there was no power in it. So now here you are. You've refined that even further. Show us what that looks like right now. Okay. So everything is level. You made me have a level arm and turn my hips. That's that power. Power comes in the hip. Because what do most people do when they throw a hook? Yeah, they throw, they wind up, right? So really, we're tight, and we throw that with the hip. Just like that. Just like that. So I taught that to her. Now she's going to teach me what I really want to learn, and that is the hula. Hula. All, All right. right. So hands on our hips. This is hula position. Hands on my hips. Feet about hip width uh, apart. Straight forward. We're going to bend our knees. We're going to do the Ami, which is my favorite move and also the ladies' favorite moves in the audience. <laughs> Not what I do if they don't. So this is the Ami. Push our hips out in a circular motion, nice and even. We're keeping our shoulders steady so they're not moving around. Okay, now I want you to bring your fist up in the center line of your body. Not touching my chest, nope. No. Okay. Nice and strong like a man. Okay. okay. Clap our hands, side. There you go. I'm twirling my hips the same way every time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I doubt that. But <laughs> <laughs> this is a great warm up. I like the hip, the hip flexors and the hip joint. The army. The army. Oh, clap. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Rocking the hula. Ah, Lee McFarland, champion, my Thank friend. You. Awesome. Thanks again. <laughs> Yeah.